You're listening to episode 56 of the Master Your Mind, Business, and Life podcast. This week's episode is for all my fellow multi-passionate peeps. In the past five years, I, of course, have owned and operated a digital marketing agency where most of my work was focused around social media marketing and website development. But I've had a lot of side hustles more than I can even count, actually, during that period of time. I've done my fair share of photography, making crafts to sell. I've even had a go at trying out two different MLM-type companies, only to realize that's just not my jam. Even today, I get so confused on what to call myself. What do I say when someone asks what my job is? Am I an author, a strategist, a podcast host? Am I a healer, a light worker? Or do I just say I'm a creative entrepreneur and leave it at that? The thing is, when you are a multi passionate creative, especially when you're a multi passionate entrepreneur, it can be really difficult to just laser focus on one thing. But have no fear, help is here. This week's guest is Amy Hayes, co-founder of the Global Creator Studio, and she is dedicated to helping multi-passionate entrepreneurs grow their business. My conversation with Amy provided me with some great aha moments, so make sure that if you have anything that resonates with you during this episode, to share it with a friend or share it on your Instagram stories and tag me at mindbizlife. Sharing is the best way to get this podcast and this episode into the homes, cars, and earbuds of many. Are you ready to dive into this week's episode? You know what to do. Tune in, turn it up, let's go. You're listening to Master Your Mind, Business and Life. Conversations with everyday world shifters, truth seekers, and rule breakers. Here's your host, Lauren Smith. Hey everyone, it's Lauren Smith. Welcome back to another episode. Today's guest is Amy Hayes. Amy is a business coach and co-founder of the Global Creator Studio with her sister, Katie Huey. Together, they created the GC Method, which teaches multi-passionate entrepreneurs how to grow a business that gives them the freedom that they crave as their own boss. Hi, Amy. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Very excited to be here. You know, it's not that often that I get a guest on the podcast who also lives in Florida like me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Gotta love it. It's actually about to rain here. So I'm like, oh, please stay away, Florida rain, (laughs) thunderstorm, that afternoon shower. (laughs) It's summer weather patterns. It's just, it's going to rain somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I'm just like, just as long as the power stays on today, we're good. (laughs) We're good. You know, I'm excited to jump into all these questions that I have for you, but let's start with learning a little bit more about you and your journey. What led you to creating the Global Creator Studio? Yeah, of course. So the Global Creator Studio is um, a company that I co-founded with my sister where we help multi-passionate entrepreneurs focus on one idea. And this really hits home for me because I am the very definition of a multi-passionate accidental entrepreneur. (laughs) So I started like way back in the day in college, undergrad, as a fine art major. And I just always knew I wanted to do something creative, but uh, didn't want to be an artist. So then I tried, I was, I had an interest in interior design. That was more practical application of my creative skills. So I ended up applying for school and getting in in London and I moved overseas and I stayed here in London and then I finished my degree in Paris and I stayed in Paris for three years until my visa expired. And then I moved to Australia and I worked with the design firm, architecture and design firm in Melbourne, Australia. So for this whole span of years of about almost eight years, actually, before I came back to Florida. And then I got into the online world. I was trying to get my design portfolio out there and I discovered WordPress and I created a blog that was going to be a portfolio slash blog. I turned that into getting freelance writing gigs with magazines and then teaching myself web design. So I tacked on you know, freelance web design and graphic design onto my set of skills. And before you know it, I had this whole like hodgepodge of things that I could offer but no real clear direction. Mm. So the global creator name actually came about from that blog that I created when I first came back from Australia. I couldn't come up with any cool names. So I picked a French name, Creatrice Mondiale, which no one could pronounce. Yeah, I I wouldn't know. 
Yeah. <laughs> like, it was not Google friendly, <laughs> but it's all I could come up with. And, um, so that actually translates to global creator. Mm. And that was my design blog, which morphed into the travel blog, which morphed into the, um, you know, website design and freelance writing. And so the global creator name stems from that. And I, I launched an online retail brand under the name, the global creator first, uh, because I wanted to sell goods that were related to all of my travels. So I had, you know, backpacks and weekender bags and hats and scarves, everything to take on the road. And then I curated uh, collections from the countries that I lived in, like handmade goods from artisans that lived were from those countries or lived in those countries. But what I found was, was that like, even though it was an online business, it still was very hands-on for me. I was doing pop-ups, uh, you know, markets, things like that. I was shipping everything out by hand. So it didn't really give me that location independence that I was looking for. Right. So I joined forces with my sister because she also had a similar freelance background of trying on a mil- million different skills. And she was really strong in branding and more of the graphic design than I was. So we joined forces and started the Global Creator Studio as a sister company. And it started as a branding and web design agency. But what we found was, was that we were working with individuals, solopreneurs and freelancers who wanted to up their presence online, but they didn't really know what they were doing. They didn't have a clear business model in place or the foundations. They were just kind of patchwork quilting things together. So we decided to take a step back and switch into more of the business coaching of helping these entrepreneurs and these young business owners really figure out what they were doing first before they invested in like a big fancy website and branding package. Mm, That's huge. That's huge. Because if you start spending all of your, your money on the wrong places and you still feel confused and lost... It's yeah. not, it's not good. And plus like, then you might come back and you not even have your branding, right? You're like, that's, that's not what I was feeling, but yeah. <laughs> you're well, confused. Is- so your designer is confused. Exactly. Everybody's confused. It's not good for your target market. You end up changing your ideas, which means you need to change your branding, change your website. And you just end up in this like round robin circle of constantly pivoting and switching ideas and trying new things things on for size without a clear strategy in place. And you can end up spending all of your resources and spinning your wheels behind the scenes before you ever even take anything to market in the truest sense. Mm. Wow. I feel like you are like speaking to speak in my language right now because I am like your target audience. I, I am a multi-passionate just person, but I'm also a multi-passionate entrepreneur in the first 10 years of really just life. Like th- throughout my twenties, I wore so many different hats. Like, I think it depends where people met me in life. It probably depends <laughs> like what they saw me doing, you know, but like did social media, I was yep. doing photography. I tried out ML- MLMs. That was not for me. It was not good. Enough. <laughs> yeah. But you know, like I just would try everything and it did look like that patchwork that it sounds like a lot of your target audience, um, really hits with, and I know a lot of our listeners are multi-passionate too, especially multi-passionate creators. Um, so, and we know that it can be really hard to just hone in on one thing. And with all these million ideas, um, we can struggle trying to figure out which is the best one to execute. So how can we just really hone in and find your one best idea? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the challenges is, is that new ideas are, are, they're shiny objects. They pop up and each one is more sexy than the last. Yeah. It's really easy to get like thrown off track. And I mean, I've done it. You heard my story, the background I've tried on a million different hats as well. So I know exactly what this feels like. And one of the things that I have learned in all of my years of experimentation and now really choosing a focus is that my guiding light is the greater vision I have for myself and who I want to be. So let's say you take five years down the road. What do I want my life to look like? You know, Mm. what, what am I doing in my day? How am I interacting? How am I showing up? Um, what, and then you can sort of reverse engineer what your business might look like. So when I said I tried online retail and realized that it was much more hands-on than I anticipated, 
And so I decided to pivot. That was because I envisioned more location independence, ability to travel, ability to work remotely baked into my ideal lifestyle five years down the road. And I realized that that business model wasn't going to get me closer to that vision. Mm. You have ideas, like if you have a really strong guiding light, like vision for yourself, then every idea that you have, you can measure against that to decide, is it going to take me closer or farther away or in a totally different direction? And use that as your criteria to decide whether to keep an idea and try it on or to nix an idea. Or even if you've been trying an idea for a while and you realize that the reality is different than the picture you had in your head, you have that idea of what you, what you are working towards to, um, support any, like how you decide to move forward in this moment. Yeah. So is is that also what you use to know, like when you should really pivot away from it? Like this is not for my higher good. What about for someone who, cause I sometimes feel like people can automatically go into the negative. Like if you're, if you ask them, where do you see yourself in five years? And they're like, well, I can tell you where I don't see myself. I don't see myself. Like it's so much easier to go into that. So how do you kind of like shift them into like, okay, so visualize where you do see yourself. Like, I feel like that can be hard to just pick yeah. one. Is there anything that like, does that come up a lot with you guys? Yeah. I mean, I think that it's very easy to, especially if you've been like on the struggle bus and you just feel like that's never going to end. Like, you, mm. but you know, it's like dating. Like you go on a bunch of dates and you know what you don't want. Yeah. What you do want is the opposite. Exactly. So, and just like right. making yeah. you focus that. Yeah. Brain. And it doesn't have to like, no one says you have to be like rainbows and unicorns and roses all day. Right. But if you can just like, you know, just write down, even if it's a simple bullet list of things that you want in your life, like travel every six weeks, mm. work from a coffee shop if I choose to. Right. Take Wednesdays off, you know, whatever it may look like that you would be the opposite of what you don't want. Just write that out. So you can have a clear, you can start to form that clear picture of what you want for yourself. And just know that it's not just because you have it all visioned out. And like, you know, if you do a vision board or whatever, that doesn't automatically like make it happen for you. There's definitely still going to be work that goes in and there's going to be times that, that are, not that easy and you're going to feel like quitting, but just embracing that as part of the process and not making that mean that there's anything wrong with your vision. Mm -hmm. It's just not a straight path because nothing is. You can either take a not straight path to something you don't want, or you can take a not straight path to something that you do want. And both are going to be uncomfortable. Just one has a positive outcome and the other one, not so much. Yeah. I love that. And really just focusing on on what your day, like I think that's so easy to just focus on what your day one. And it actually sounds like a really easy journal exercise for someone. It's just like first steps, like, all right, write down everything you want your life to look like. Or if you say like do a vision board, like that could be a really easy thing as well. You kind of touched on being able to travel. So entrepreneurs who travel like myself, I think it can either be Like traveling can be your sweet spot. You know, like when you're on the plane and you can write like 20 blogs, you know, it's just like, ah, yeah, I can laser focus. Or like me, it can be your pain point (laughs) where you just aren't productive at all. So what tips do you have for staying productive while you're traveling? To travel at its core is a distraction from the everyday, whether you're going to be productive or not. Like Mm -hmm. you have new stimuli, you've got a new environment, you have new things to do, see, eat, hear, all of it. So traveling is, is an opportunity to see how well you've set up your habits at home before you hit the road. Mm. So, For example, if you are in the habit of like, brain dumping everything on your to-do list, but you're only crossing off a third of it each week. You don't have a lot. You're not building a lot of faith in yourself to do what you've written down. So when you get out on the road, you already like subconsciously know that you're not going to get it done. And it's easy to just be like, well, I'm traveling. And it's just, you know, slip into that habit of not fulfilling your to-do list or what what you set up as your tasks. Now, if you've built a habit of, If you write something on your to-do list, and this does practice constraint, you're going to have to be really picky about what you put on that to-do list. But if you have built the habit of fulfilling everything you've written down and assigned yourself for that day or that week, 
when you get out on the road, you have so much trust in yourself and your ability to get it done that your change of location doesn't matter. It requires a little bit of finesse with your schedule. Maybe you need to block off some time to focus on work, but you, you deep down trust yourself that you're going to get it done. Yeah. And you can start this by building my, we call them micro habits, but basically just giving yourself like starting with one or two things a day that you put on your to-do list and you fulfill those without question. And then once those are easy and you're in that habit, add one or two more. Like don't overload yourself because if you over, like so many of us overload our plates and then we're like, oh, I can't get it all done because we're starting with these habits of not keeping our word with ourselves and writing all the stuff down that we're used to not accomplishing. And then we get upset that we're not, like we're judging ourselves for it. So if we can start with really easy, small wins and start to build that habit slowly until, yeah, let's say you're traveling for a week and you've got 25 things on your to-do list that you deem to be important, but you know you're going to get them done because you always keep your word to yourself. Yeah. And I, and I think that's a really good point to bring up. Like it is, if you're writing a to-do list, like you, you gotta get it done. You know, like I'm definitely not one of those person that that can leave a hundred things left uncrossed off. I get too much satisfaction crossing off things on my to-do list <laughs> to like yeah. not get to them. But I love that. That is such a good way to think about how to be productive while traveling. I am a mass prepper. So when I travel, it's like I have everything scheduled, everything done ahead of time because I know myself when I am traveling, I get very like ADHD and <laughs> like, my, you know, like my attention's just everywhere. So where I would be really, really diligent with my to-do list, um, I know that like certain things could fall through the cracks. So like I'm, I'm a mass scheduler ahead of time to lighten my, my workload. Um, where I know like some of my friends when we travel, they do, they do exactly what you said. They'll schedule out like an hour before activities and be like, Hey guys, I got to get on a conference call real quick. Or, you know, like I ha- I have to get this out before we do anything today. Like it's just very orderly. I love that. What a great tip. Yeah, I'm so much more, I'm, you know, optimize your schedule to what's going to work for you. Like, mm-hmm. and part of the joy of traveling is being able to take that time to say, I'm going to go to a museum or I'm going to go do this yeah. I'm gonna do three hour coffee or something. So if you know that you can set yourself up for that kind of experience, because again, if you're going back to your greater vision and you exactly. want to travel every six weeks and that looks like being on more of a relaxed trip than a hectic work filled trip, then know what you need to do in order to make that happen. All comes back to what you want your life to look like. Exactly. I love it. I think this is another um, common struggle for business owners, especially when we're talking about that the to-do list and especially when we're in the startup phase and you want to make more money and it feels like you're drowning in that to-do list. How can we find a way to still get what we need to do, you know, everything we need to accomplish, but also start making more money. Yeah. I think that one of the best ways to figure out how to make more money is to first figure out where your money is coming from. Mm. So if you can track your, let's say you're in your first couple months of business and maybe you have a few clients and you can go back and look at where you, like what you did to bring those clients in like those are the activities that have the highest ROI for you. So let's say maybe it was in-person networking events, or there's a specific referral contact who sent you a few clients. Like what can you do to strengthen that relationship or spend more time in those in-person networking events so that you are doing less tasks? You're not trying to blanket the internet with your offerings. You're just being more focused, more highly focused on those activities that have proven to have results for you Mm. because there's a million strategies and you can argue that every single one of them could work for you, but not every single one of them can work for you at once right? unless you have a huge team. And I think using the data to make the decision instead of making it from a place of desperation or overwhelm or some of that, that more of an emotionally driven state. Like if you have data and you can say last month I went to four networking meetings and I signed two clients or I had five phone calls that came out of that. Like here is something that is proven to give me results versus I spent an hour every day on Instagram, but I got no results from it. Like, well, exactly. that doesn't, 
yeah, Instagram doesn't have to be dead for you, but it, it just doesn't need to be your focus right now. Yeah. It's a low level priority. Exactly. There's so much freedom to be found in giving yourself permission to focus on less. Mm. Likewise, if Instagram, you're getting hundred sales a day to your e-commerce store, but you're yeah. not getting, making any connections going to your, you know, small business meetup, boom, spend more time on Instagram. There you go. Now yeah. You know. I love that. It, yeah, it, it makes so much sense. Right. It's a science experiment. When you're looking at data, you can just look at it like a math problem and be like, okay, if A plus B gave me C result and I don't want C result or I want more of C result, how can I tweak A and B? Mm. And if the equation's much more complicated than that, you have too many variables. Like it's going to be very hard to actually pinpoint what, what is the factor that's working. I love the way you simplified that. Thank you. <laughs> it's just, I, know, I know it seems like really elementary, but when you're a business owner, man, you're just looking at every way you can to make money. So to just yeah. hone on in on that one way is huge. It really is. Yeah. Um, staying on this topic, sometimes I think we have to take radical action to really catapult our business. Is there a way to do this without really overwhelming ourselves even more? Yeah. I mean, radical action goes back to building that habit, like to Mm -hmm. making those actions, those small, like completing your to-do list, whatever those tasks are that you gave yourself to do each day and seeing them through until you get to the result that you want. So in spite of setbacks, in spite of failures or things don't work and you don't let that stop you in your tracks and make it mean all these terrible things about you and your value as an entrepreneur. And you'll never make, you know, all these stories that we tell ourselves, you just, okay, now you have some information, you have some data that that way didn't work. I'm going to take action in this way next to try that. Mm. So radical action really is about just persistence and continuing to take action until you get the the result that you want and doing it in that bite-sized way so that you're not piling so much on your to-do list. And you, you do have that trust that if it's on your list, if it's on your calendar, it's going to, it's as good as done already because you assigned it to yourself. You're your best employee. Is there a good, yeah. (laughs) Is there a good way to like organize this and to like, because I think that's something that we all kind of struggle with of, you know, I know I need to make change, but one, how do I hold myself accountable and how do I organize it in a way that makes sense for me to follow up? The most simple way to do it is to literally put it on like your Google calendar, your iCal or whatever. Like you have things on your to-do list and assign yourself a due date and a due time, like work on deadline. Like you were, when I was doing freelance writing, everything was tied to a deadline. I knew I was going to hit that deadline every single time, no matter when I got the, like, the interview. De- there were times when I did the interview and had to write the article on the same day that the, the article was due wow. because the way things worked out with my interviewee. But I knew I was going to get it done because I had, I had to turn it into that editor and I wanted to keep that relationship strong. So when I had, would have it on my calendar, 5 p.m. this date, it's due. No question. So that is a super simple system to implement, especially if you're starting with just one or two things. And then if you're someone who likes, you know, fancier tools, you can use a project management software like Monday, Monday monday.com or Trello or Asana or whichever one feels most user intuitive to you and, and map out things. And again, give them that assignment due date so that you know, like there's no just... I didn't get to it this week. I'll put it or today I'll put it on the next day or the next week because that's how things end up getting drawn out and not getting done in the Mm -hmm. end. Yeah. And writing it down somehow always makes you feel a little bit more accountable. (laughs) Tell us a little bit about your 30 day action plan. I saw that's a free download on your website and I grabbed it before our call, but I'm going to admit I haven't had a chance to open it yet. (laughs) Yeah, this is our, our, template really to help you build those micro habits of Mm -hmm. putting something like looking at the end of 30 days, 30 days is a long enough time to, you know, achieve something. So you can map out a goal for the end of your 30 days or whatever, whatever milestone you want to focus on. And then you can reverse engineer it into each day assignments, like one or two a day to build up to that 30 day goal. And it's our exercise to help train yourself that if I write it on the calendar, I'm going to get it done. And if I get it done, it's going to add up to this result. 
Ooh, I like that. And that makes it so easy. And it just gives you like little bite-sized thing, ways to just really hit that big goal. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the example that we have on it uh, right now is for a magic, if you're coming up with what we call a magic bullet offer, which is like your signature offering yeah. and reverse engineering all the steps that you need to take in order to come up with that at the end of 30 days. And like in the examples, it's, it's one or two things to do each day. And then there's rest days built in. Like one day might be just, you know, congratulate yourself. You've come, you've accomplished a lot. Cause I think one of the, one of the things that we do to ourselves is we don't stop and acknowledge how far we've come. We just keep focused on how much farther we have to go. Mm. And that can keep us very tired because that, that is a moving target. Like it's always going to be off in the distance. So really taking time to appreciate like, Hey, look, I accomplished all of this this week. I am allowed, like my boss is giving me the day off or the afternoon off and you're right. your boss. You don't have to get it. Appra- like, yeah. <laughs> that, you know, reward. Yeah. I love that. I, I think we had a podcast guest on once and, um, she said every time like she had closed a really big deal, she bought herself something from Tiffany's and, she, and she was just like, it was my gift to myself to congratulate myself for doing a job well done. So I think like, it could be something as big as that, but like, yeah, giving your, yourself a day off or just going out to dinner to celebrate like, Hey, I, I did it this week or have a glass of wine, whatever, you know, is, is your choice. But I love that. Celebrate your small wins. Yeah. It's permission to, you know, enjoy the process more mm. you, know, you might have so much farther you want to go and you might like if you start to succumb to the pressure of I'm so behind I need to do more because that's when we start piling more on our yeah. list and start trying to get it done faster then we kill the joy in the process and and that's what leads to burnout and overwhelm oh man so true and like burnout and overwhelm is a topic for a whole whole different day. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard to come back from once you're stuck in those. It, it really is. It really is. And I love what you and your sister are doing because it's really helping entrepreneurs really avoid burnout. Because if you're a multi-passionate person, burnout is can really ensue fast. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's all those shiny objects we have to chase. Yeah. It's like Dory, like, Ooh, exactly. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Squishy. I love it. Amy, where can our listeners go to learn more about you and connect with the Global Global Creator Studio further? Absolutely. Our website is studio.theglobalcreator.com. You'll find our action plan download there as well as links to our Facebook group. We have a, a private Facebook community called Business Without Boundaries that really is our platform for other entrepreneurs to connect, collaborate, and grow together. Um else Instagram is at the GC underscore studio and we have our podcast called business without boundaries where I I get on there and just riff about topics that interest me or that I feel like would be like really fun learning points and bring on guests that I think would be you know balance everything out I, so. abs- I love that. I'm going to have to check out your podcast. I did download the 30 action plan, like I mentioned. So I'm going to mindfully fill mine out this week. I encourage our listeners to go over and grab it as well. So we can all kind of be in this together. Amy, I have, I've loved learning from you and I love that you have shared ways to just level up in business. So thank you for joining me today and for sharing your wisdom. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure being on. You can find direct links to Amy's website and social channels and her 30-day action plan on this week's episode notes found on mindbizlife.com. Before we end, I just want to take a moment and honor the lives that were lost on 9-11. Not only those who lost their lives, but to honor those who proved to be heroic, beyond belief, and risked their lives to save others. I will always remember where I was on 9-11 18 years ago today, and I'm sure you do too. Take some time to reflect and be grateful for life. I'll see you back here next week, but until then, remember, every level of life is an opportunity to grow. Be well, my friend.